Welcome, everybody. Uh, good evening uh, or good morning, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Horst Neuhaus. Uh, I have the pleasure to moderate a very exciting satellite symposium, and I'm uh, very grateful uh, to the Pentax team for organizing and uh, supporting this symposium. Now, it's uh, on Barrett's from diagnosis to treatment of Barrett's related neoplasia and beyond. So we would like to cover the whole management of Barrett's within one hour. And uh, very much appreciate that we have five excellent speakers, which I, uh, whom I will uh, introduce individually. And uh, we would like to start with Rayan Hydri from London. He is a consultant gastroenterologist and uh, hepatologist of the University College Hospital and the Cleveland Clinic in London. Unfortunately, he cannot join us here in Prague, but we can see you, Rehan. Uh, thank you very much for participation. And um, we decided to pre-record all lectures to be on the safe side in such a hybrid meeting, and therefore, I would like to ask you now to run the first video, and later on, we have time for discussions. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Rehan Hadri, uh, and it's a real pleasure to be part of this uh, Pentax sponsored, uh, sponsored symposium at the ESGE days in 2022. Uh, my presentation is going to be on the diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus and uh, looking at various classification systems that we have created with the use of the Pentax system. These are my conflicts of interest. So, we know that we have a long way to go when it comes to uh, improving our um, miss rate for early esophageal neoplasia. Um, we know that numerous studies have been published which show that up to 20% of diagnoses of Barrett's cancers will occur up to 12 months after an index normal endoscopy. And there are many different explanations for this, such as the possibility of a very rapidly developing cancer, but more importantly, and actually more accurately, is probably because of missed lesions. And dysplasia detection is really, really hard. This study published by um, uh, Professor Bergman's group uh, showed that even patients who were referred with visible, uh, with dysplasia uh, and no visible lesions, that actually when experts scoped them, they were able to upstage and find visible lesions in the majority of these patients. The standard of care at the moment is a Seattle biopsy protocol, and all societal guidelines uh, stipulate that we should still be using this. But not only is this work intensive, resource intensive in terms of pathology costs and time pressures on an endoscopy suite, but also samples less than 5% of the surface area of Barrett's esophagus. It is really like looking for a needle in the hay haystack. And as you will see in this Congress in Prague, there are numerous new imaging modalities. Um, every single endoscopy company has uh, squeezed as much information as they can into that CCD at the end of your endoscopes, but also the uh, computerized post-processing is giving us images that is really allowing us to find micro cancer. So my one advice to anyone who's beginning on this journey of endoscopic diagnosis and ultimately endoscopic therapy is to give your patient every chance. Use your best available endoscope, but spend some time understanding the technology, understanding how your endoscope, how your endoscope works and the functionality in terms of the various settings and the virtual chromoscopy settings. You can see here, this is a patient who is referred with low grade dysplasia. And as we toggle through the different enhancement settings uh, with this system by Pentax, this is the optical enhancement system, the OE, which is a combination of filtering and post-processing. You begin to recognize something that we overlooked with the white light image is here on the anterior wall in the 12 o'clock position is an advanced cancer. So this comes from using your enhancements. It comes from using uh, good insufflation, good technique. And here you can see a combination of uh, the chromoscopy and optical enhancement in Zoom allows you to make diagnosis. 
So what do we need to look for when we use chromoscopy in dysplasia detection? You need to look, especially in the esophagus, areas of asymmetry, non-flat areas, nodularity, ulcers, friability. And the endoscope really gives us very simple algorithmic binary information. We know that normal mucosal architecture and vascular architecture are uh, in keeping with normal tissue. And as we start to see disorders and irregularity in the mucosal patterns, and then also in the vascular patterns, we begin to get inflammatory tissue. And ultimately, as this becomes more and more featureless in terms of mucosal patterns, engorgement of the vascular structures, this is early cancer. And we can help ourselves by using uh, dye-based chromoendoscopy. And in Barrett's esophagus, the only dye-based chromoendoscopy agent which has reached PIV is acetic acid. So you can see here, ladies and gentlemen, this is a patient who was referred to our center some years ago. Uh, this patient was referred for radiofrequency ablation. And you can see here, this is using um, uh, surface enhancement with the Pentax uh, scope, the Highline series, as uh, you begin to see that there is uh, an area in the two o'clock position which catches your eye, which is non-flat. So your first instinct is to interrogate this area and mark it as your area of highest suspicion. And this is the area that you would target your forceps biopsy or indeed your endoscopic resection. But actually, ladies and gentlemen, if you now begin to look with the addition of, uh, of, of, of virtual chromoendoscopy and then we use acetic acid, that nodule looks quite innocuous because the surface pattern is quite regular. But with acetic acid, actually, the area of most abnormalities on the contralateral wall where you've lost acetal whitening, and this was a mucosal cancer. And diagnosing and classifying is what we do. This is the BIN classification from uh, Olympus. Um, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the BLI classification uh, published from the Professor Bergman's group. We have looked at something similar with the iScan classification for BE. This was the initial iteration from the first generation endoscope, looking at mucosal and vascular patterns using acetic acid and not using acetic acid. Um, and we demonstrated using this when we compared with narrowband imaging uh, with uh, magnification and acetic acid, we had an accuracy of 79%, slightly lower than our NBI studies. But the sensitivities and specificities were very close to our competitors uh, and um, the uh, existing technology. As always, the technology evolved in iScan optical enhancement, which combined post-processing with the filtering technology at the tip of the endoscope, using a similar iScan classification for normal mucosal pattern and normal vascular patterns, and subsequently irregular, disordered, featureless uh, mucosa and dilated um, uh, uh, blood vessels. By using this very M1, M2, V1, V2 system, we were able to show that in a combination of trainees and experts, the accuracy for detecting di di dysplasia in the experts was 84%. And actually we showed in uh, uh, the trainees that uh, using optical enhancement over white light endoscopy enhanced their dysplasia detection. Ladies and gentlemen, just to finish off, this is the future of optical imaging, not just in the esophagus and Barrett's neoplasia, but also in the colorectum and in the stomach. And this is all artificial intelligence, which is everywhere that you look, and I'm sure you will see a lot of it in this conference this week. And this goes on the basic principles that we take an endoscopic image and we train a neural network over and over again with multiple, multiple images of normal, abnormal tissue. And then we generate algorithms that allow us to train this uh, algorithm to give us an output when we feed it completely new images or real-time images during endoscopy. This helps us to differentiate between dysplastic and non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. And various groups have already begun to show the um, uh, uh, the, 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 the accuracy of this. This is a, an example of our system in collaboration with Odin Vision. So you can see here, this is a patient with a previous endoresection uh, appearing for a Barrett's assessment. And you can see here, this is a real-time uh, uh, decision-making tool that can be used in the endoscopy unit to guide your sampling or indeed your therapy for marking lesions for endoscopic resection. So the unit is real time, so it is integrated into part of your endoscopic screen. It has been trained on Pentax images. 
So you can see here that this is with the white line image, you can see the area of the previous endoscopic resection. And if I just move this forward slightly, you can then see that as we now begin to integrate the AI system, it is with the foot pedal telling us what we believe is uh, dysplastic tissue or indeed what is uh, non-dysplastic tissue. Um, so you can see here just by focusing on, on these areas there uh, with a freeze, you can actually take uh, a picture and you can see here it says it's dysplastic. This is a work in progress. And this has currently just been accepted, I think, in the last few weeks. Uh, our fellows has published our first, uh, about our second iteration using heat maps where multiple delineations were carried out and high quality images from 57 patients. And our data demonstrated an area under the curve of 96% and a sensitivity of 94% and specificity of 86% on par with the previous data published in the space. So the future, not so far away, is you'll be able to take an endoscopic picture real time. You'll be able to look at it with optical enhancement. You'll be able to generate a heat map. You may even be able to take magnification endoscopy um, and subsequently the same with dysplastic tissue where the heat map will allow you to reduce unnecessary sampling, reduce time, which is better for the patients. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, there are multiple factors for optimizing detection of barrier neoplasia. There are physician factors, which are technical, which allows you to have adequate inspection time, a good meticulous approach in terms of photo documentation. There are cognitive systems uh, factors such as learning these uh, grading systems, these tools, and, and finally, I institutional factors, making sure you have the best available uh, equipment. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the Congress. Thank you, Rehan, for this uh, comprehensive review and uh, also of uh, predictions for future developments in diagnosis of Barrett's, which is, of course, a very important step before treatment. So I hope that you can stay with us uh, and join the discussion at the end of this uh, session. And I also ask uh, our uh, online participants to use the live chat and to send your questions, and uh, we will involve them in the uh, Q&A session at the end of uh, this meeting. So now it's a pleasure for me to introduce Ayun Koch, uh, from the Department of Gastroenterology of the Erasmus uh, University in Rotterdam. And uh, he is a very advanced endoscopist uh, in diagnosis as well as in uh, treatment. And uh, we are looking forward Ayo, to your presentation on resection techniques and also very important on forward peer-to-peer -peer training. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to talk to you about advanced endoscopic resections in the esophagus and the forward training program. These are my disclosures. Ladies and gentlemen, ESD in the esophagus can be extremely difficult. Especially squamous cell cancers can be difficult to delineate. And because we find ourselves in a tubular structure in the esophagus, whenever we make a lateral cut, we always approach muscle layer. So we have to cut in a circular fashion. Not to obstruct the entire lumen, we use a stepwise and partial lifting technique. And scope control is poor because of constant heartbeat and breathing. To partially overcome these problems, we often use a tunneled approach. I'd like to show you my approach. It's what I call the double J and C shape incision. Here you see it lesion in the esophagus with markings around, and you see the proximal and distal end. I make two J-shaped incisions, starting from the lateral side all the way down to the distal margin, and only then move to the proximal side and making a C-shape incision. C-shape because it opens up nicely and creates easy access to a submucosal tunnel. I carefully leave these two tissue ridges intact, which act as tethers to keep the specimen in place. Then I proceed making a tunnel, submucosal tunnel, all the way to the distal end, making it as broad as possible until I reach the lateral margins, and only then take out the two remaining tissue ridges before we retrieve the specimen. 
Here you can see that in a full circumferential lesion, quite a large lesion in the esophagus, so there's no lateral incision in this specimen. But we only create a distal circumferential incision before we move to the proximal circumferential incision. Here you can see how we proceed. So I use stepwise partial lifting, then a few cuts, and again some lifting, until we have this full circumferential distal incision complete. And once we have this complete, we move to the proximal side and create two C-shaped incisions. Once we've done that, we try to gain access to the submucosal space, carefully dissecting submucosal tissue, and before we know it, we find ourselves in, sub in a submucosal tunnel. And as you can see here, um, we have completed the tunnel all the way down to the distal circumferential incision. So then we create our second C-shape, carefully avoiding this vessel, dissecting around before taking out the vessel, creating the tunnel, and then again tunneling our way all the way down to the distal circumferential incision. You can see that we've reached that now, and we re-enter uh, the esophageal lumen. Then we connect these two tunnels through submucosal space before we take out these last two tissue bridges and sending the specimen for histopathological assessment. Now, as you can imagine, these large resections can lead to stricture formation in the esophagus. And actually, stricture formation is a major limitation in esophageal ESD. We've recently performed a meta-analysis looking at all the larger studies that uh, report on stricture rates in ESDs over 75% of the circumference. And we found a pooled stricture rate of 75%. In the last few years, we have been treating our patients with a dispersible budesonide tablet to prevent strictures. And we reported a retrospective uh, consecutive cohort of 42 patients. Where we treated them with topical budesonide in varying doses. And we found that stricture rates, which were 75% in a historical cohort, dropped to below 50% in our cohort. So that was a significant difference and a very promising result. Because of that, we're currently running a double-blind randomized trial called the Pegasus trial, where we study the orodispersible topical budesonide uh, that we all know from the eosinophilic esophagitis. Now, moving on to the forward pro training program. In 2019, Together with Pentax Medical, we developed the forward training program. And since then, Pentax has taken this job very seriously, and they actually uh, founded the Forward Academy, um, providing training for different uh, therapeutic interventions uh, for endoscopists in training. The forward training program was largely based on the ESD training curriculum by the ESGE. And this combined, this encompasses a lot of animal training under supervision. Live animal model training is a very valid tool for uh, hands-on training compared to the human experience. And here you can see in a validation study that we performed that both tutors and trainees highly appreciate this model for ESD training and also for complication management. We also published that by repeated training in this model, novices actually perform better, not only in ESD speed, but also in the percentage of on-block resections, with a diminished need for tutor interventions and less perforations. Let's see what happens when we change during training to a different knife, suddenly there is a drop in ESD speed, an increase in the need for tutor interventions and also perforations. I think this under, underlines the, uh, the idea that most of us have that, especially in the early learning curve, you need to be trained with one specific knife.
So this was our this is our forward program, and basically it is uh, divided in six steps. First step is of course basic lectures, knowledge about ESD, combined with hands-on ex vivo and in vivo model training. That is combined with case observation in the European Mentors Hospital. Um, we then move to uh, <coughs> performing cases in the Mentors Hospital. The next step is performing cases in the Trainees Hospital with the mentor as a guide. We can move to online case mentoring and finally, we also have Japanese colleagues that can mentor our novices in ESD. These are the European experts involved in the forward training program, and also quite a few Japanese experts involved in this program. Unfortunately, when we wanted to start the program was exactly the time when the COVID-19 pandemic hit us. So we had to cease all activities, but uh, we quickly switched to an online platform. And we use the Proximy online platform, which is basically a surgical platform, but ideal for uh, these kind of procedures. Um, also highly interactive with the online uh, participants. When things turned a little bit normal, we quickly moved back to hands-on X and in vivo ESD training, as you can see here in our skills lab in Rotterdam. And finally, we also were able to perform ESD in the trainees hospital with a mentor present, as you can see in the picture. So here you can see the, the class of 21. Um, and I'm very pleased to tell you that in 22, we already started with a new program with very enthusiastic uh, young interventional endoscopists. We had a, a course in Hamburg with uh, ex vivo model training. And by now, uh, when this presentation is shown, uh, we also had a ex an in vivo training uh, in the new skills lab in Dimanche in France. So ladies and gentlemen, coming to the end of my conclusion, I think ESD is the first choice for early esophageal cancers. Strictures are a major limitation. I believe that topical budesonide is a novel treatment option with very promising results. The forward program is a unique training program designed according to the ESGE ESD guideline uh, to train our highly motivated young interventional endoscopists to become proficient in ESD. Thank you for your attention. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Ayun, and congratulations uh, what you have achieved with this introduction of a very interesting and important uh, training program. And we are looking forward uh, to the next steps and uh, for distributing these uh, options. Now, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Rose Pau from the uh, Amsterdam, from the University Medical Hospital or Center in UMC in Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, she is, of course, also very experienced in Barrett's diagnosis and uh, treatment, uh, working close together with this uh, fantastic uh, team under the leadership of uh, Jack Bergman. And uh, today she will talk about uh, web-based training for Barrett's. Hello, my name is Roos Pauw. I'm a gastroenterologist at the Amsterdam University Medical Centers, and I will be talking about web-based training for Barrett's esophagus from imaging to treatment, and I will be using bestacademia.eu as a reference. These are my disclosures. So Best Academia is an idea we had because we wanted to offer a wide range of teaching material to a very broad audience um, in a way that we could also renew and update it very easily. And so that became the bestacademia.eu website. And on the website, we have three very um, important features in managing patients with Barrett's neoplasia. We have a part on imaging, a part on treatment, and a part on pathology. And all the different parts contain a number of presentations and other teaching material 
um, that can be used to train yourself in these um, subjects. And all the contents of the Best Academia website is prepared by a training program committee. So Professor Berkman and I initiated the platform and for the contents, we have help from a number of expert endoscopists in this field and also from a number of expert pathologists. And management of Barrow's esophagus patients starts with imaging. So we have a number of different um, presentations on our website and in this presentation, I will just guide you a little bit through what you can find on our website. So starting with the imaging presentations, we have, for example, a presentation on Barrett's surveillance, giving you six uh, very easy steps to perform a Barrett surveillance endoscopy. So next to very basic information, there is some background information, for example, on optical chromoscopy techniques from different endoscopy systems. Everything is nicely illustrated, of course, with endoscopic images. And next to the basic um, information and a more advanced information. Um, a nice feature is that via our website you can access the BORN module, which is a teaching module that can help you um, improve your neoplasia detection rate. And on this slide I will show you a video of the BORN module. So the BORN module contains a number of white light endoscopy videos, pullbacks from Barrett's esophagus, and in these videos, a neoplastic lesion can be seen. And you are asked if there's a neoplastic lesion, yes or no. And then you're asked to place a mark where you would take a targeted biopsy. You do that with your mouse. And next to taking a biopsy, you're asked to delineate the lesion. You can also easily do that with clicking your mouse around the lesion that you think is neoplastic. And the nice thing is that after you've done this, you can get immediate feedback by looking at delineations made by three expert endoscopists. They also saw the same video you just watched and they were asked the same questions. And you see that by turning on and off their delineations, you can assess what they thought was abnormal and why they thought it. It's also uh, maybe a little bit reassuring that they do not agree 100%. And they did these delineations throughout the whole video that you watched. Um, and it can be very helpful to rewatch this and see what they delineated as abnormal um, to train yourself what type of mucosal or vascular pattern fit with their delineations. And if you placed your biopsy mark and your delineation in the area that all these three expert endoscopists also found abnormal, so the sweet spot, then you did a very good job. If you placed your biopsy mark or your delineation not within that sweet spot, don't worry. And there's a lot of teaching material on this website to improve your neoplasia detection um, performance. And of course, as you are listening now, you will probably be using a number of different endoscopy systems. And the nice thing is that on this website, you can find these training modules for a number of different um, endoscopy systems. For example, for the Pentax module, you see two images here one with white light endoscopy and one with optical enhancement and both of them contain an early neoplastic lesion. You can select which picture uh, you prefer. Um, so in this case, the optical enhancement picture was selected. Again, I, as in the video I just showed you, you can place a mark where you think you want to take a biopsy and you can delineate the lesion. Uh, and of course, you get immediate feedback from the delineations from the experts. And there are a lot of different cases to practice. So after endoscopic imaging, of course, if you find a neoplastic lesion, you want to treat it. So there's a lot of information and teaching material on treatments on our website as well. We have a range of different presentations on different endoscopic rejection techniques, for example, 
The presentations are presented by Professor Bergman, so you can watch the presentation while he is presenting. Um, and next to some basic information, we have some presentation on the more challenging cases as well for the more advanced users. Next to endoscopic resection, we have information and presentations on the different ablation techniques, for example, radiofrequency ablation. And lately, we have a very nice range of presentations on cryo-balloon ablation. Um, and these presentations are presented by Professor Wurston, who will also uh, be presenting on the cryo-balloon ablation system during this symposium. And of course, pathology is a very important part during Barrett's management. So we have um, a number of presentations on that as well. And those are uh, as well as for pathologists, but also for endoscopists who just want some more background information on this very interesting subject. If you want to keep up to date, um, you can also listen to our dedicated podcast series. For this series, we invite uh, different experts to tell you about the latest scientific insights. And you can subscribe to our newsletters by emailing Eva Verheij, one of our PhD candidates. Um, and these newsletters are sent every two months by email and they contain a lot of new information, for example, on updates or new contents on the website. Um, so with that, I would like to invite you to visit bestacademia.eu um, I showed you what you can find on the website, but of course there's much more to, uh, to find and uh, well, I invite you just to go through it and see what it has to offer to you. Thank you very much for your attention. So this is uh, very impressive uh, what you have achieved in development of this uh, web-based training program and I can only encourage everyone to make use of it. Uh, I think it should be obligatory if you, if you try uh, to increase your experience in management of Barrett's, it's really a must uh, because it's extremely helpful. So next speaker, so the Netherlands is very well uh, represented, um, but this is uh, a pleasure to introduce Professor um, Bas Voisten from the University of Utrecht and uh, he will talk about a relatively new technology, uh, cryo-balloon ablation of Barrett's related neoplasia. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to discuss with you the cryo-balloon ablation system for Barrett's esophagus related neoplasia. These are my conflicts of interest. And let me first discuss with you the system. The system consists of a handheld controller, a foot pedal and a balloon. And a balloon can either be a focal balloon and also a larger area balloon, referred to as the 180 balloon. So this is the system mounted together. You can see the handheld controller with a touch screen here on which you can modify the settings. And underneath this black cap, there's a canister containing liquid nitrous oxide. And the handheld controller is uh, connected to the foot switch and also to the balloon, as you can see here. So let me explain how it works. So this is a schematical representation of the balloon. There's a balloon and within the balloon, there is a catheter and if liquid nitrous oxide exits the canister then it runs through the catheter and exits through a side hole here and will result in an ablation area of approximately two square centimeters and in the process of transition from liquid nitrous oxide into gas it expands but it also cools down to minus 80 five degrees of Celsius. And then the gaseous nitrous oxide exits through a separate side hole through the same catheter backwards to the handheld controller and then vented back into the room. 
By venting back the expanded gas, it prevents overinflation of the stomach, which was a problem with the catheter-based cryoablation systems. And here you can see an example of ablation of islands of Barrett's. When ablating the uh, Barrett's esophagus, you look through the inflated balloon, as you can see here, and you can move the dispenser here uh, using the foot switch in both axial direction as well as in rotational direction. So you can see here nicely that the inner dispenser is rotated, the balloon stays in place, inflated, and then you can easily target these islands here, um, which are opposite to the previously treated islands. And if you then deflate the balloon, you can nicely see the ablation effect. It is an ice patch formation on both sides of the esophagus. This is a representation of the 180 balloon and likewise the focal balloon, liquid nitrous oxides runs through the inner catheter of the balloon and then it will spray into a fan-like appearance and then it automatically retracts the uh, dispenser from distal to proximal resulting in an ablation of about 3 centimeters in length covering 180 degrees of the circumference, so half of the circumference. And again, the expanded gas is vented back through the catheter into the room. This is an example of a treatment using the 180 balloon. You can see the dispenser here, the inner catheter, and these are the area of the top of the gastric folds. While looking through the inflated balloon, the dispenser automatically retracts within the balloon while the balloon stays in place, resulting in an equally distributed um, ablation of once again 3 cm in length covering half of the circumference. And the intensity of the ablation is of course a result of the pullback speed of the diffuser here. If you let it pull back fastly, then the dosing will be lower uh, compared to when it pulls back very slowly. And after you've covered half of the circumference, you can rotate using the foot switch the diffuser aiming at the remainder half of the circumference. There are two balloon shapes, a regular balloon, but also a pear-shaped balloon. And a pear-shaped balloon is especially useful in situations like this, when there is an endoscopic resection scar resulting in a slightly focal narrowing and asymmetrical retraction within the esophagus. Um, and this balloon shape will stabilize the position of the balloon in situations like this. If you use side-by-side -side ablations, you can perform a circumferential ablation of Barrett's esophagus, as you can see in this example. This is a short Barrett's esophagus. I'm now aiming the first focal ablation at the 11-12 o'clock location, and then you can easily rotate the diffuser aiming at a spot adjacent to the previous ablation. And if you repeat this, you can ablate the entire circumference in five or six ablations. And you can see it demonstrated in this small video, which of course is a little bit upspeeded for the purpose of this demonstration. And if you then come back, or not come back, if you wait a couple of minutes, then, and the ice has defrosted, the ablated area turns purplish. So this is all ablated and deeper down into the stomach here, it, it is, um, well, the regular color, and this is the ablated area, which is more purplish. 
The efficacy and safety has been demonstrated, for instance, by this multicenter study reported by, reported by Mimi Kanto uh, in 2020. And she reported on 120 patients with a Barrett's esophagus with a maximum length of 6 centimeters. And almost half of the patients has had um, endoscopic resection previous to the ablation. And she used the side-by-side -side ablations with the focal catheter, as I showed you in the example. And she reported a technical success rate of almost 96%. And in a per-protocol analysis, after one year, there was a complete eradication of dysplasia in 97% and a complete eradication of all intestinal metaplasia in 91% with a stricture rate of 12.5% necessitating a median of one dilation each. And these graphs show you also the intention to treat analysis. So in blue, the per protocol analysis and in yellow, the intention to treat analysis for complete eradication of dysplasia and complete eradication of intestinal metaplasia. We are currently performing a large multicenter European study, <coughs> prospective study, on the efficacy and safety of choir balloon ablation using the focal choir balloon in a similar fashion as shown by Mimi Kanto. And these are the participating centers. Um, once again, in this study, we are using the focal choir balloon in 107 patients with a maximum of five treatment sessions, sessions per patient using a dose of eight seconds. And the study is almost completed and we will hope to present the results of this treatment in the next session of the ESGE days. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of my presentation. I'm very happy to take any questions at the end of this session. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bas. Excellent uh, presentation and uh, very convincing videos. So it looks uh, easy and uh, it's really convincing. Thank you. We will finally discuss also this uh, technology for ablation of Barrett's. And our last speaker is now Gajit Kara uh, from the Geisinger Medical Center is a gastroenterologist in uh, Danville in Philadelphia and uh, Hashi will talk about cryo-balloon ablation. What's next? Hashi, uh, yeah, you are online. It's a pity we miss you here in Prague. Hope to see you at another occasion. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for attending our session. Thank you. And thank we you run your time. video and then we have time for discussion. Good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Harshit Khara. I'm an interventional endoscopist at Geisinger Medical Center in Pennsylvania, USA, and I will be sharing my clinical and research experiences with the cry balloon ablation for its application beyond Barrett's esophagus. I serve as a consultant for Pentax Medical. Our objective today would be to review the role of cryo balloon ablation for esophageal squamous cell neoplasia, G-junction adenocarcinoma, refractory gave, duodenal adenomas, colonic adenomas, and anal intraepithelial neoplasia. There have been two studies, one each from the Western and Eastern worlds, encompassing patients with low, medium, and high-grade intraepithelial neoplasia. There was 100% resolution rate in both with complete response with just one treatment in 80 to 90% of patients and 100% with two treatments. No SAEs were noted and the durability of treatment ranged from 97 to 100% at one year follow-up. I have had personal experiences with these patients wherein my 80-year-old patient with history of lung cancer, status post lobectomy and radiation presented for endoscopy for symptomatic dysphagia and found to have mid-esophageal squamous cell neoplasia. She was not a repeat surgical or radiation candidate, 
with unsuccessful endoscopic resection due to fibrosis and thus underwent cryoballoon ablative therapy. Patient was found to have residual nodular disease at the site of prior EMR seen on white light and narrow band imaging. A Lugol's iodine staining revealed unstained lesions throughout the mid-esophagus at various sites. A cryoballoon ablative therapy was performed with a treatment of 10 second treatments per site. Multifocal ablations were done in the same session and all the unstained lesions were successfully treated. Post-treatment, successful cryotherapy changes were noted throughout the esophagus at various sites. At two-month follow-up, patient did not have any residual lesion endoscopically or histologically. Cryoballoon ablation is also of benefit in patients needing palliation of GE junction tumors causing symptomatic dysphagia and are not stent or feeding tube candidates or may need a bridge to new adjuvant therapy. The 65-year-old patient with recently diagnosed GE junction adenocarcinoma was referred to me for EUS staging with fiducial placement in prep for new adjuvant and image guided radiation therapy. I was able to combine cryoballoon ablation treatment in same session as staging the US for palliation of symptomatic dysphagia. On endoscopy, patient was found to have distal esophagus and GE junction mass. This was successfully treated with a pair cryoballoon, which sits much better across stenosis. 10 to 12 second treatments were done at various sites involving the tumor. This was followed by circumferential treatment seen on time lapse circumferentially around the GE junction, treating all residual neoplasia. Post treatment, there was significant improvement in luminal narrowing, and patient was able to tolerate an oral diet without any further treatments and successfully complete the new adjuvant therapy. I was part of this multicenter study evaluating the role of cryoballoon ablation in 23 patients with refractory GAVE. We had 100% technical success rate and 83% of patients did not require any transfusion post-treatment at six-month follow-up. There was a significant transfusion reduction from 1.8 units down to 0.3 units per month and 87% of patients had greater than 75% surface eradication of GAVE. This patient had symptomatic iron deficiency anemia from chronic blood loss as a result of her GAVE. I was able to successfully treat this patient with a focal cryoballoon therapy. The balloon sits very nicely against the pylorus in the prepyloric area, and multiple sites can be treated in the same session again with 10 second treatments per site, and post-treatment cryotherapy changes were seen. This patient did not require any further treatments and did not require any transfusions and was able to be treated with a single session of cryoablation. I was also part of this multicenter study evaluating the role of cryoballoon therapy for treatment of flat duodenal adenomas. 17 adenomas were treated in 13 patients with 30% requiring only one treatment and 70% requiring two treatments. We had 100% technical success rate and 71% of polyps had complete endoscopic and histologic eradication with median of just one triballoon ablative procedure. All patients had greater than 50% decrease in size without any interval progression or serious adverse events. For duodenal adenomas, there are two kinds of patients I would like to highlight. One which have very notable lesions, easily seen with white light and narrow band imaging. These lesions can be easily targeted through direct visualization through the cryoballoon. And targeted therapy can be performed 
with the new Gen 2 system, which is able to move the diffuser to the site of the treatment. On follow-up, there is no residual lesion seen just with a single 10-second ablative treatment. On other instances, these adenomas are subtle and cannot be seen very distinctly through the balloon visualization. These lesions appear indistinct and thus require thermal marking using a stair tip coagulation to highlight the areas of treatment, which can then be easily seen and targeted using the focal or pair cry balloon based on the location in the duodenum. A single treatment ranging between 10 to 12 seconds is performed using the new Gen 2 system and cryotherapy changes are noted. And on follow-up, there is no further endoscopic or histologic residual lesion at the site of treatment. There was a case report published showcasing the novel role of cryoballoon ablation for residual colonic adenoma after EMR with an adherent endoclip. Single session treatment showed complete resolution of the residual polyp and endoclip detachment. I have also had success in treating refractory and recurrent colonic adenomas with cryoballoon therapy. This is my 77 year old patient who was found to have a rectal TVA and underwent an EMR at another facility. On surveillance, she was found to have recurrent adenoma at the EMR site and thus underwent an endoscopic full thickness resection. Despite this, she had polyp recurrence at the FTRD site for which she underwent an endorotor resection of the scar tissue. On surveillance, despite prior multimodal therapy, she continued to have recurrent polyp and thus I undertook cryoballoon ablation for this lesion. There is residual polyp seen at the scar site on white light as well as narrow band imaging. These lesions can be easily targeted, especially located in the end in the rectum and focal cryoballoon ablation is successfully performed under direct visualization. Multiple 10 second treatments semi-circumferentially under visualization is performed of the entire scar tissue and cryotherapy changes are noted. On follow-up, there is no re residual polyp at the EMR site. This was confirmed histologically and endoscopically. There was a case video published demonstrating the role of cryoballoon ablation for high-grade anal intraepithelial neoplasia. This is an edited version of the case video published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology that showed the lesion on white light and narrowband imaging to be a Paris 2B lesion, which was confirmed on histology. Endoscopic visualization and focal cryoballoon therapy was performed circumferentially with seven eight second ice patches delivered via the cryoballoon at the dentate line. Overlapping ice patches are done to avoid any areas of untreated mucosa in between and surveillance over 20 months showed no recurrence of the stricture. I hope to have showcased the various successful applications of the cryoballoon system for efficacy beyond Barrett's. Thank you. Archit, uh, thank you very much. Uh, very impressive. So obviously neoplasias of the whole in GI tract seem to respond to cryoablation. Uh, very impressive, uh, but of course we need more research. So uh, we have uh, some minutes left now for discussion, and I would like to ask uh, our AV team if uh, Rehan is still online in London. No, uh, he had an emergency case, so he's not, uh, no longer with us. But then uh, I would like uh, to ask questions in terms of uh, diagnosis. So we have seen an enormous progress in imaging, and uh, this may be further improved by AI in the future. And the question is, uh, do we need, still need histopathology? So in particular, the Seattle protocol, or can it be completely replaced now with advanced imaging? Or also a question related to that, 
do you still see cases in which the mucosa looked quite normal of Barrett's, but the pathologist uh, finally gives you the diagnosis of dysplasia or even mucosal cancer? Ross. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So uh, thank you for the uh, interesting question. Um, so I think uh, uh, so. everything starts with the imaging, right? As Rayan said, give the patients the best chance um, to do the best imaging you can. Um, so I think the, the step before that is that everybody really needs to, before you take biopsies, of course, also you need to do a good inspection, so the esophagus needs to be clean, and you, you have to have a structured approach. And I think if you go, go ahead like that, so you have a clean esophagus, you take your time to inspect the esophagus, know what to look for, um, I think maybe sitting here at the table, we could recognize um, early neoplasia even without uh, biopsies, but we know that that is very difficult, and most general endoscopists during their career, they only rarely see um, early neoplasia. So I think it's too early to um, discard the biopsies for that purpose, um, because as it is now, it's still part of the, of, the, of the surveillance as we do it. And I think even with, if we have the best AI system that doesn't miss any lesions, you still need to have a good endoscopy in clean esophagus okay. um, well, to have the AI system detect the neoplastic lesions, yeah. of course. Please go to the microphone if you have questions here, yes? Please go to the microphone. Mark Giovannini. But, but we have always a big problem with the, the pathologist and the interpretation of the biopsy because uh, um, even if the, the, the pathologist is a very uh, skilled, we have sometimes different response uh, about uh, dysplasia, uh, low grade, high grade, and, and, and we, 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 we don't know. And sometimes we, we have uh, a, a typical images uh, of uh, and the pathologist is not uh, uh, corresponding that uh, the, that would we have endoscopically, and uh, and we we did uh, we did a, a study in Europe in Marseille in, the, in three different uh, three different pathology units, and uh, with the patient who, who had uh, who underwent a total uh, resection of the Barrett by by EMR, we compare the results of the biopsy and the EMR. And uh, the concordance between the, the three pathology uh, um, doctor was uh, le was uh, less than uh, fifty percent. Uh, I think it's it's it's, it's difficult today to, to, to say that uh, uh, the biopsy is uh, is uh, it's a uh, normal or metaplasia to be sure that it's uh, only metaplasia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah, that's that's tr true. But I think um, so. That's why there's, I think, a lot of research also aimed at objective markers, the biomarkers. Um, but I think it also starts with recognizing lesions and knowing what to biopsy, of course. And I yeah. do think that most pathologists, like high grade and cancer, um, so if you have a lesion and the pathologist says it's non-dysplastic, then I think you, of course. And unfortunately, it will take a long time until you can convince oncologists and surgeons in the tumor boards that they should rely on the endoscopic appearance. The yeah. same with, uh, with chromo and with uh, cholangioscopy in the bile duct. They need histopathology or they ask for histopathology. Um, so it was also nicely shown, it may be not too difficult to detect the neoplastic area, but delineation is really challenging. And you showed us how to be trained uh, but I had the pleasure also as one of the experts to delineate, and the results show there is a huge, very huge or substantial variation between experts. But a provo provo uh, provocative question is, I think Ion doesn't need it, because when, when his approach is once there is a neoplastic lesion, he immediately... Uh, proceeds to circumferential resection, then you don't need the lateral margin. This is, of course, uh, the Japanese approach. Once uh, you see it, but I think it's still related with stricture formation. This is, I think, yes. you can use budenoside 
You can inject steroids, but all of us know these patients who come repeatedly for dilatation. So how do you do it in daily practice? Well, thank you, Horst, for that question. Maybe first of all, um, terribly sorry for the very poor sound recording. It didn't sound like that at home, but I heard it, heard it here, and it's disappointing. So I hope you still had a good chance to follow the lecture. Um, so regarding the circumferential resections, um, maybe you also misunderstood. I don't always do a full circumferential uh, excision, uh, at least not for a 55% circumferential lesion. Um, but uh, I do mark around, and I, I think we have the same problem, that we do not always have the same delineation. Uh, I also uh, tried in this, this program. But um, with markings around, especially for all areas that I find suspicious, and then dissect around that, so you have a double safety margin. But then, of course, comes the problem with the strictures. Um, I showed you the 50% stricture rate, and that was with in different dosage um, that we used. Actually, we used the anima there. So um, now that we have uh, dedicated um, solution for, for the esophagus. So I hope the stricture rates will drop even more and we can be more wider on our esophageal resections. Okay, thank you. A related question to, to Bas. Uh, do you agree that at least all elevated or depressed lesions have to be resected by EMR or ESD? So what we select patients for ESD, if there's any um, sign of uh, submucosal invasion. Um, but the flat areas can be ablated, for example, with a carrier balloon, because the risk of submucosal cancer is more or less zero if the lesion is completely flat. Uh, thank you, Horst. Yes, I think I tend to agree, but not fully. Oh. Um, yes. Oh. Yeah. It's good for the discussion, right? <laughs> because I think that any visible lesion should be resected because once in a while you end up with a mucosal cancer with, for instance, lymphovascular invasion, although it's flat. And although it could be treated and ablated fully with cryoablation, for instance, then still you want to have histopathology of a uh, visible lesion. And maybe just to come back to the differences in delineation um, in the a module uh, that was shown by Rose. These are delineations done on the overview image and not on um, um, near focus or zoom images. And I think that the concordance would be better if we would have done it on the um, zoomed images. Uh, but but you, I, I also agree with you, uh, but you have to admit that lymphatic invasion in a mucosal lesion even if it's cancer limited to the mucosa, is extremely rare. It's rare. Uh, and, uh, but I agree we have another approach in, in Europe than in the United States. They much more frequently directly proceed to ablation uh, for high grade dysplasia uh, than we do in, in Europe. So unfortunately, there's no more time left. But uh, Hashid, um, I would like, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Yep, I hear you. OK. Uh, this was really uh, interesting what you showed us, um, but do you agree, we, we, is, is there no risk of uh, proceeding to cryoablation, especially in the duodenum with delayed ne necrosis? It looks very impressive, but uh, how to estimate how uh, long you can apply cryo in the duodenum? Uh, thank you. And, and like you said, these are case series or case reports, and obviously we need more data on this, which is what these discussions and symposium help with. Uh, but in the duodenum, no, I've not had any issues because the dosimetry with the Gen 2 system, it, the depth is directly related to the duration of the treatment. So if it is a flat lesion, I tend to stay with 10 seconds. If it's slightly raised lesion, like a 2A lesion, then I expand it to 12 seconds. If it's a wider lesion, you know, encompassing two to three folds, then I extend it to 14 seconds. So it is definitely not one size fits all, and that has prevented any complications. But do you agree that patients should, should be in, enrolled in studies? Not everybody should start tomorrow with ablation and the duodenum and, and colon. We need more data, huh? 
No, definitely. And that's what, you know, the data that we showed, we had done that initial uh, case series with Mimi and myself and some of the other centers. And, you know, we definitely need more collaboration across on this. So oh, this okay. was just a proof of concept to show that it's safe, it's feasible and it works clinically. Okay. Unfortunately, I have to close uh, this session. I think uh, we learned a lot, a very interesting, exciting uh, symposium, still many open questions, good reason to meet again. So this is a challenge for Pentax to organize another uh, symposium. Thank you very much for, for you, for your team, and uh, for the excellent presentations from our speakers. And uh, I hope that you also enjoyed this symposium and have a great evening uh, in Prague. See you tomorrow. Thank you.